Welcome to St. John's for our fifth midweek Lenten service, which we will be providing online. And uh, thanks to Meredith Frederick for filming, and Mr. Wook for playing, and Mr. Larry Cagle for reading. And we will begin with our reading for this evening. It's a reading from Mark chapter 12. And they sent to Jesus some of the Pharisees and some of the Herodians to track him in his talk. And they came and said to him, Teacher, we know that you are true and do not care about anyone's opinion, for you are not swayed by appearances, but truly teach the way of God. It is lawful to pay, is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Should we pay them or should we not? But knowing their hypocrisy, he said to them, Why put me to the test? Bring me a denarius and let me look at it. And they brought one, and he said to them, Whose likeness and inscription is this? They said to him, Caesar's. Jesus said to them, Render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. And they marveled at him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. God. We will be singing hymn 850, God of Grace and God of Glory. Lord, let it be to me according to your 
word. And we continue to ask our Lenten question, what can you do? Not all of us will be called to do exactly the same things, except there are a few things that God does call all of his people to do. And we've been looking at those. The first one was be sorry, repent. And then we want to behave, go and sin no more. And then we want to believe, do not be anxious, but seek first God's kingdom. Then be fair, judge not that you be not judged, forgive as you've been forgiven. And this week we want to look at be civil. Civil has to do with anything related to being a citizen. And in our reading from Mark, the Herodians approach Jesus. Now, the Herodians were supporters of Rome. They were Jewish individuals, but they were very much beholden to Rome. And so they would have happily paid taxes. But they come to test Jesus, to try to get him into trouble, asking him a question about civil responsibility. Should we pay Caesar taxes or not? And Jesus asks for a coin and asks whose image is on it. And they admit it's Caesar's. And Jesus famously responds, Render to Caesar the things that are Caesar, and render to God the things that are God. Caesar Augustus was the emperor when Jesus was born, as Luke reports in his second chapter, and he did what governments do. He asked that all the world be registered. He took a census, just like we're taking now in the U.S., and that was for taxation, because governments do tax. When Augustus died, he was replaced by his stepson, Tiberius, and Tiberius had a long reign as well, and he was emperor when Jesus began his public ministry, as Luke reports in his third chapter. Luke there gives us a catalog of all the officials for both the government and the religious community. Tiber Tiberius is Caesar, Pontius Pilate is governor, Herod and Philip and Lysanias are all kings of the different regions, and Annas and Caiaphas are the high priest for the church. And Luke wants us to know who is in charge when it comes to the civil and religious responsibilities. And it's in that context that Jesus gives this answer that is still relevant to us today about being civil, about doing our civil responsibilities to render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's. Peter, in his first epistle, also gives us some important instruction. Be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution, to the government. Whether it be the emperor as supreme, he was the top dog at the time. Or if it be governors as sent by God himself to punish those who do evil and to praise those who do good. God has established those governments. For this is the will of God, that by doing good, by being good citizens, we would silence the ignorance of foolish people. Then Peter says, live as people who are free, because we are, but don't use your freedom for evil. Honor everyone, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the emperor. Give to the emperor what he is due, and to God what he is due. At the same time, Peter, in the book of Acts, has an encounter with the Sanhedrin, with the leaders of the religious community, and he gives a very famous answer when they tell him to stop teaching about Jesus and to stop doing all these signs and wonders. And Peter says we ought to obey God rather than men. So even though we are to obey the government, never obey the government over and against God, whether it's the government of the world or the government of the church, because Christ is supreme, because it wasn't an emperor or a governor who died for our sins, but it's only by Christ's wounds that we have been healed. So when we come
come to the corner of church and state, under normal circumstances, there really shouldn't be much tension. All right? We are advised by God to just be good citizens. But if there is tension, then we have to understand what our church teaches about the two kingdoms. It comes from the time of the Reformation. There are two kinds of authority. There is the authority of the temporal world, what Luther called the kingdom of God's left hand, that is government, and there is the there is the kingdom of God, which is the realm of the church, the kingdom of God's right hand. They are both important. They both come from God, but obviously the kingdom of the right hand is the supreme and most important of the two. This fine-looking Greek gentleman is Eric Metaxas, a best-selling author, a, a Christian author, and he's written many biographies in which he tries to point out some of these important things dealing with the institutions, the governments of men. One bestseller was Martin Luther, his biography that came out for the 500th anniversary of the Reformation. And he points to that moment when Luther defies both Pope and Emperor in the city of Worms when he says, I must follow my conscience which is captive to the word of God. There was an instance where he had to obey God rather than men. He also wrote a bestseller about Dietrich Bonhoeffer. And Bonhoeffer was a Lutheran pastor and theologian and he was in Germany during the time of the Nazi regime and he experienced this tension wanting to be a good citizen and at the same time having to be faithful to God he ultimately was put to death because he was faithful to God another bestseller his first one in fact was Amazing Grace in which Eric McTaxis tells the story of William Wilberforce the man who led the charge to end slavery in the United Kingdom. That was another bit of tension between one Christian leader and the government. And he also wrote recently a book called If You Can Keep It. When Benjamin Franklin came out of the Constitutional Convention, he was asked by a lady, well, do we have a monarchy or do we have a republic? And Franklin said, a republic, if you can keep it. And so this book deals with some of our responsibilities as citizens. Eric McTaxis was born in Danbury, Connecticut, which, as watches are to Elgin, hats were to Danbury. It was the hat capital of the world. It was Hat City. And unfortunately, the factories are all gone now. But Eric McTaxis says Danbury should be noted for something else, a letter that President Thomas Jefferson wrote to the Baptist Association of Danbury, Connecticut, because it was in that letter that Jefferson coined the term the wall of separation between the church and the state, as he tried to explain the establishment clause of the Constitution. Well, get out your nickels. Whose image is on there? Jefferson's. Render to Jefferson the things that are Jefferson's, but he's looking right at the other aspect. In God we trust. Render to God the things that are God's. And you can argue about whether or not there should be a wall of separation. Obviously, we enjoy religious freedom in this country, and for that we should be grateful to government and to God. Another person born in Danbury, Connecticut, was Charles Ives. When he was 14 years old, he began his career as a church organist and composer. When he was 16, he wrote one of his greatest pieces of work, Variations on America. Here he is, much older, but his Variations on America, his baseball symphony, and other themed Americana music have survived. He's the first real great classical American composer. And those variations on America include the fact that we are a free country with religious freedom and that people worship as they see fit. 
He married a woman named Harmony Twitchell. This is Harmony's father. He is the Reverend Joseph Twitchell. And they got married in a very special location in Connecticut. They got married in the home of Mark Twain. Because Joseph Twitchell was best friend to and pastor of Mark Twain. And Twain lent them his house for the wedding. And in his great American novel, Huckleberry Finn, Mark Twain gives us another example of a conflict of conscience. He gives it to us in a very different manner, however. Huck Finn, as you all know, runs away from his abusive father. There he encounters uh, Jim, a slave who has also run away, a slave from Miss Watson's farm. And the two of them take off down the river on a raft in search of freedom. And along the way, Huck's conscience begins to bother him. And in the book, he explains, I was being bothered because Jim was almost free. And who was to blame for it? Huck takes that responsibility. He said, here was a man who's owned by a person, and I'm going to work to get him free. And as he's about ready to turn Jim in, his conscience does a flip-flop. And he realizes that if he turns Jim in, that would be wrong. And if he doesn't turn him in, that would be wrong, as he had been taught. And he understands I really got to go ultimately with what my conscience and heart are telling me. And that is an understanding of tension between church and state, between morality and government, that Huckleberry negotiates his way through. And in the end, he's very satisfied that he does not turn Jim in, and Jim ultimately is given his freedom. But stories like these about conflicts of conscience are stories that help us to understand we need to be civil. We need to be good citizens, and we also need to be good members of Christ's body, the church. Pontius Pilate, governor of Judea, had a conflict of conscience. When Jesus was brought to him, and they wanted Jesus to be crucified. They needed Pontius Pilate to do that because they did not have the authority to execute Jesus. Pontius Pilate doesn't want to do that. Pontius Pilate wants to set Jesus free. And ultimately, he thinks he can wash his hands of it, but he can't. Because he does something that he knows is wrong just to appease the crowd who cry out to him. If you don't execute him, he who said that he was the king, then you are no friend of Caesar's. And that's what turns Pontius Pilate into a conspirator for this false execution. But Jesus' opponents didn't understand that this ultimately really was God's work through his son and Jesus being handed over, that was Jesus fulfilling his role as the Redeemer. And this great statue of Christ the Redeemer, right now at night they're showing on it these different flags. These are all countries that have been impacted by coronavirus. But we can look at it not only in that aspect, we can look at it and understand that Caesar only goes so far and that Christ, our Redeemer, is Savior of the world and He is the King of kings and He is the Lord of lords. And so we as His people, we do obey the government, but we always obey God rather than men and we celebrate Jesus' love and grace and mercy for the whole world. To Him be the glory. Amen. For our prayers this evening, we're going to use the ancient litany of the church. We join our voices with Christians all over the world who still pray this litany. 
We join our voices with Christians from centuries past as we come before our Lord and seek His mercy. The litany, if you have a hymnal, is on page 288. O Lord, have mercy. O Christ, have mercy. O Lord, have mercy. O Christ, hear us. God the Father in heaven, have mercy. God the Son, Redeemer of the world, have mercy. God the Holy Spirit, have mercy. Be gracious to us, spare us, good Lord. Be gracious to us, help us, good Lord. From all sin, from all error, from all evil, from the crass and assaults of the devil, from sudden and evil death, from pestilence and famine, from war and bloodshed, from sedition and from rebellion, from lightning and tempest, from all calamity by fire and water, and from everlasting death, good Lord, deliver us. By the mystery of your holy incarnation, by your holy nativity, by your baptism, fasting, and temptation, by your agony and bloody sweat, by your cross and passion, by your precious death and burial, by your glorious resurrection and ascension, and by the coming of the Holy Spirit, the Comforter, help us, good Lord. In all time of our tribulation, in all time of our prosperity, in the hour of death and in the day of judgment, help, help us, good Lord. We poor sinners implore you to hear us, O Lord, to rule and govern your holy Christian church, to preserve all pastors and ministers of your church in the true knowledge and understanding of your wholesome word, and to sustain them in holy living to put an end to all schisms and causes of offense, to bring into the way of truth all who have erred and are deceived, to beat down Satan under our feet, to send faithful laborers into your harvest, and to accompany your word with your grace and spirit. We implore you to hear us, good Lord, to raise those who fall and to strengthen those who stand, and to comfort and help the weak-hearted and the distressed, we implore you to hear us, good Lord. To give to all peoples concord and peace, to preserve from our land discord and strife, to give our country your protection in every time of need, to direct and defend our president and all in authority, to bless and protect our magistrates and all our people to watch over and help all who are in danger, necessity, and tribulation, to protect and guide all who travel, to grant all women with child and all mothers with infant children increasing happiness in their blessings, to defend all orphans and widows and provide for them, to strengthen and keep all sick persons and young children, to free those in bondage and to have mercy on us all, we implore you to hear us, good Lord, to forgive our enemies, persecutors, and slanderers, and to turn their hearts, to give and preserve for our kindly use the kindly fruits of the earth, and graciously to hear our prayers. We implore you to hear us, good Lord. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, we implore you to hear us. Christ, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world, have mercy. Christ, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world, have mercy. Christ, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world, grant us your peace. O Christ, hear us. O Lord, have mercy. O Christ, have mercy. O Lord, have mercy. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. 
Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. O Lord, as we have known the incarnation of your Son, Jesus Christ, by the message of the angel to the Virgin Mary, so by the message of his cross and passion, bring us to the glory of his resurrection. Through the same Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Lord bless us. Defend us from all evil and bring us to everlasting life. Amen. Our closing hymn was written by Francis Scott Key. A prayer before you, Lord, we bow. Thank you. 